a new world. <laughs> Completely new world. Um, we'll see. Definitely. And I've never been to Germany before. So, I mean, I would love to, to do that you, one day. You've got to go. I know. I know. You're it's most also welcome. A Invited. Welcome. No, I, thank you. <laughs> I have a spare room. My daughter is not around at the moment. So, <laughs> anyway, we all have to wait, no? I know. I know. That's listen I can't wait till that day so I'm going to start the webinar and we're just going to wait for people to come in hi everyone thank you so much for joining us well, people are on time time okay thank you for being here <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. Please feel free to share your name, your pronouns, where you're from and what brings you here. Um, we're just as excited as you are um, to have Dr. Tiffany Florival and Ms. Abena Adamako here to talk about Afro-German women's movement building. So thank you so much for being here. We'll get started in a few. Hi, Alexis, she, her, Florida. Excited to learn more about the movements across the diaspora. Wow, thank you, Alexis, for being here. We'll be getting started in a minute or so. We're just gonna wait for a couple more, for a few more people to come in. Hi, Thema from the UK. Thank you for being here. Perfect. Hi, Nikki, PhD student in comparative literature, and I study Afro French and Afro German women. Wow. Hi, Axman, Somali Dutch, but based in Berlin at the moment, and looking forward to learning more about the work of Afro Jewish folks have done. Thank you so much for being here. Um, wow. There's a lot of people here. Hi, Julia from Houston, Texas. I'm curious to learn about Black women's experiences across the diaspora. Martha, Berlin, Germany, master's history student and wanted to learn more about Afro-German history. Wow, so this is great. I think um, please continue to populate the chat with your name, your pronouns, where you're from and what brings you here. And we're about to get started. So my name is Jamie Swift. I am the executive director of Black More Radicals. And if you're not familiar with Black More Radicals, we are a Black feminist advocacy organization and we are dedicated to uplifting and centering Black women and gender expansive people's radical activism in Africa and the African diaspora. So I am so excited to have this um, wonderful event and so happy that Dr. Florville and Ms. Abena said yes to the event on Afro-German women still speak out. And so this event is in honor of the 35th anniversary of the publication of Fabi Bekkenen that was later translated to English and published in 1992 as Showing Our Colors, Afro-German Women Speak Out. Um, Fabi Bekkenen was actually published in 1986. So 35 years later since the publication of Fabi Bekkenen and Showing Our Colors and the founding of the initiative of Black Germans, um, and Adefra, how do we pay homage to and learn from the life, leadership, and legacies of pioneering Afro-German women activists? So this is the this is the, what the discussion is based on, and we will have um, an intergenerational, an intersectional conversation with Dr. Florville and Ms. Abenum, and we're just so excited for them to be here, both of them to talk about um, the historical and contemporary legacies of Afro-German women's movement building. And also this event is a part of Black More Radicals Afrofeminisms in Europe series, which is a political meditation, celebration and interrogation of Afrofeminisms and Black feminisms in Europe. Before we get started, I really want to establish that this is a safe space. Uh, and if you're familiar with Black More Radicals, this is what we do all the time, right? And, um, and establishing the safe space 
I say that we don't allow any homophobia, transphobia, queerphobia, ableism, white supremacy, massage and more. I don't accept it, we don't accept it, and it will not be allowed in this space. So please respect the space. Please respect our amazing and wonderful guests. And I'm about to introduce our, our wonderful guests. So here we go. Ms. Abena Adamako is a pioneering Afro-German human rights activist, networker, and author. She is the co-author of Showing Our Colors, Afro-German Women Speak Out, which I said before is the English translation of the German book, Fabe Beckenen, published in 1986. It was the first published book by Afro-Germans. She is the co-founder of the Initiative of Black Germans. Founded in Berlin, Germany in 1986, ISD was formed as an advocacy organization for Black Germans and was one of the first organizations for Black people in Germany. She is also the co-author of Sisters and Souls, Inspiration of Mayim, from Mayim, Mirror Glances, Perspectives of the Black Movement in Germany, and Rebellious Berlin. So Ms. Abena, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, thank you. Uh, Dr. Tiffany Florville is an associate professor of 20th century European women's and gender history at the University of New Mexico. She specializes in the histories of post-1945 Europe, the African diaspora, social movements, Black internationalism, as well as the gender and sexuality. She has published pieces in the Journal of Civil and Human Rights in the German Quarterly. Florville has also co-edited the volume Rethinking Black German Studies, as well as published chapters in Gendering Post-1945 German History, and to turn this whole world over. Her recent manuscript, Mobilizing Black Germany, Afro-German Women in the Making of a Transnational Movement with the University of Illinois Press, offers the first full-length study of the history of the Black German movement of the 1980s to the 2000s. She sits on the advisory board and editorial board for several organizations and journals, including the Black German Heritage and Research Association, and on the editorial board for Central European History. She is also an editor of the Imagining Black Europe book series at Peter Lang Press. So thank you so much, Dr. Forville, for being here, both of you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, this is so exciting. And also one thing beforehand, um, if you would like to uh, have a live transcript or closed captions, please yield to the uh, live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and just toggle over it and the live uh, transcript will, will uh, come up. So going into our conversation, I would really love for us to talk about the historical context of Black Germany. And first and foremost, this question goes to you, Ms. Abena. May you please share with us in the audience about your background and your family history to provide some historical context about Black communities in Germany. Yes, hello everybody. Um, thanks for having me, uh, Jamie. And um, yeah, my background, um, my great-grandfather um, came from uh, Cameroon in 1891 with among other um, individuals uh, from Cameroon because it was then a, a German colony. And um, he came with uh, the Verma Linie, a, a German uh, shipping company. All those who came um, were invited um, to study or work and um, arrived in Hamburg at that time. And that is how it happened that um, my grand great grandmother met my great grandfather, and um, yeah, it was then a time when um, quite a few uh, came from the colonies to yeah establish themselves. Also, my grandfather came from Cameroon, um, and the very important thing for me is that uh, they were uh, both actually very happy to come to Germany, but at the same time, they had to find out that they are also not welcome. Um, yeah, and uh, my father itself uh, came from Ghana, so I have a Cameroonian and uh, Ghanaian background. That for short, um, maybe you would like to yeah, thank you so much, Ms. Abena, for providing 
some context because I think that is important for people to understand, um, like I said, the historical context of black communities in Germany. And Dr. Florva, do you mind from your uh, expertise sharing more about the historical context of black communities in Germany? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I guess uh, German colonialism uh, began with the Berlin or the Congo Conference in 1884 to 1885. So I think um, Otto von Bismarck held the conference um, in the Berlin Palace um, near where um, Anton William Amos Strasse is currently in Berlin. Um, but Germany also was involved in uh, enslavement um, earlier, sort of in the 17th century. So it began with the Brandenburg Company. So it has a longer lineage predating um, the Berlin Conference in the 19th century. And so as uh, Ms. Abina uh, mentioned, there's, they had colonies in German Southwest Africa, German um, East Africa, so Togo, Burundi, uh, Cameroon uh, and, and the like. And so after World War I, they lose their colonies and oftentimes those colonial subjects were in a, um, became uh, protectorates of either the um, British or the French. Um, so and many of them were sort of stranded in this liminal space in Germany, not quite German, German um, subjects again, and now um, French or you know, British um, subjects. And so um, there's a much more of a longer lineage in terms of thinking about the African diaspora in Germany, predating the 19th century, certainly dealing with not only sort of the Brandenburg company, but also with um, scientific explorations that Germans um, were engaged in. So there's a, a much, much longer um, lineage that people oftentimes don't think about. We oftentimes think about, when we think about Europe, we think about Britain, France, the Dutch, um, and rightfully so, but Germany also needs to be sort of considered in these longer, longer discussions about the African diaspora. Yes, um, you were talking about uh, Anton Wilhelm Amo, and that uh, the thing is, in, in Germany, in early history, people believe that um, Africans came 100 e years ago to Germany, but that is not the fact. It was the 14th and 1500th century. We already, because, um, because of trade you know, and, and slavery trade. Um, so um, that is actually something which is lacking in uh, German history. The stories are not told. And um, for, on my, with my personal history, I'm very proud to say that my great grandfather and my grandfather um, as I mentioned before, they came 100 years ago to uh, Germany. They were invited, but still they were not uh, accepted. Um, they were not treated well. And both of them um, um, were activists, which um, I first didn't know because, you know, uh, family stories, sometimes you tell things, but then uh, you, you, you forget to or you, go, you don't go deeper into a painful history. And um, my great-grandfather, for example, he was one of the first who signed a petition, a petition of a uh, community-based uh, association for, uh, well, let's say Africans. They came from different parts of the continent. Um, to, uh, and went to the um, colonial, colonial office uh, for a petition. And you can still see if there's a plague, there's um, a sign in Wilhelmstraße where also the Africa conference was held. And you can see his signature. And um, also my grandfather um, was amongst those to organize that petition. And um, that is something which really, um, astonished me last year because I also, I didn't know if uh, a professor from the UK, Robbie Aiken, and um, he made a research on that one and it, it came to me and I was so surprised. And, um, and all, at the same time, it's, it's very sad that a hundred years later, we are still fighting the same fight uh, for recognition and uh, among other <laughs> issues, yeah. Definitely. I'm sorry, Dr. Forva, did you want to uh, comment? Yeah. 
I mean, I think, um, Ms. Abina, I think what's so amazing about your, the sort of legacy of your family is that like, you also were a phenomenal, and not to suggest you're not an activist now, but like you were part of that generation that really helped to push for change in Germany um, by creating um, ESD and, you know, doing all of this work on the ground. And I think what's amazing about sort of thinking about the Black German movement of the 80s and 90s, not to suggest a previous or previous organization and mobilization by individuals of African descent didn't occur, but in the 80s and 90s, I'm struck by, you know, now we have like hashtag activism. We have digital activism. You guys were, you know, photocopying flyers. You were on the ground, not using, you know, using the technologies that were available. Whereas today, I think no, we're we, able to- we just went up to people and asked them, would you like to join? And would, I, would you be interested? And, you know, yeah. Yeah. speed, and, or, speed yeah. work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sort of, gra but that's grassroots activism. Um, and I think that's so exciting um, in, a, in a world where we're so like, we're so tied to the digital um, that like, I think it's striking for people to recognize that like, you're, you're going up to people, you're advertising in newspapers, you're doing a variety of things to try to form a, um, a community, a larger community. Definitely, and I appreciate the, this context because um, Loris um, said in the comments, colonial history is not taught in schools. Everything our children learn about this subject is from us. And I, I thank you both for, like I said, contextualizing because um, one of the reasons why this series was created because uh, I didn't start learning about black communities in Germany until I was in graduate school and had a course from Dr. Clarence Lusane on racism in Europe. And then I was able to meet um, Afro-Austrian uh, um, activists and black, black women, black people from Moldova. And so this is a conversation is to really dispel and, and disrupt notions that Europe is, is just white <laughs> and that, that black communities are here, they have been here and they'll always be there. And so thank you so much for, for that context, um, most definitely. And I would want us like, Dr. Florvo, you went into the conversation about grassroots activism, uh, uh, Ms. Abena's uh, con uh, radical contributions to uh, movement building in Germany. And so um, Ms. Abena, do you mind sharing and providing some insights about the political climate mm -hmm. and context which spurred the publication of Showing Our Colors and the form formation of ISD and ADERFRA? Um, I'm curious how were Afro Germany, how for German communities being treated at this time, and why was it important for you to co-found um, such an important organization as such as the Initiative of Black Germans? Yeah, political cl climate. Um, at those days, it for me it was not really a political climate. It was a need. It was a need. Um, which um, erased when uh, Audrey Lord came to Germany. Audrey Lord, um, teaching at the university here in Berlin, was uh, wondering or asking, where's the black community? And there was uh, not really a black community. I was not among the students, but those students, um, as I said, they um, then set out to look for Blacks in Germany, Afro-Germans, and um, to start and build a Black community. So Audrey Lord was um, the ignition um, for that. And um, I think it was an urge, a need um, to, yeah, to have a community. And that is when, when um, the first meeting was held at a friend's place. We were about 20, 20 25 people. And it was a relief to, to, to meet with um, Blacks from Germany, which we, we all came from some uh, sort of isolation. And um, it was a relief to see that you're not alone. And so we started to build up um, the initiative for Blacks in Germany. And um, the, the important thing was that, first of all, after being relieved, we, we realized that we had to educate ourselves, that we had to empower ourselves 
because we didn't get it from the school system nor anything else. Um, we had to find our own history, our history, not our history, our story. Um, as I was saying, it's not very well known that uh, Africans um, have been in, in Europe or in Germany in the 1500s, yes. And um, so that is how we started off. A friend of ours, uh, Danny, um, had a um, uh, Black American uh, heritage. He went to America and uh, was there during the time of the Black History Month. So he decided and introduced that Black History Month in Germany. That is how we started off. And that Black History Month was then, um, we had um, a part where it was only for Black people to educate and empower ourselves. And then with the, with the German community as well, also to introduce them to um, an updated history. Uh, yes, that is how it um, happened. And then we went also to an exchange with America and Canada. And that was 30 years ago. And when we went to America, some people even were surprised that they were wondering whether um, how it's possible, or they didn't know that there's um, mixed race marriages allowed, or um, that there's still black people that have survived the Second World War. It was really strange because um, uh, stories are not uh, transported, transferred, and um, so. It, and that is thirty years that um, all my yeah, companions and uh, from the community are trying um, to get that um, portrayed. Thank you for sharing. And Dr. Forville, I know that you could also provide further context in terms of how ISD, ISD and um, ADERFA were formulated and conceptualized. And particularly, I'm also, um, Ms. Abena talked about how Audre Lorde uh, was so critical into igniting um, Afro-Germans to find one another. I'm also interested in your opinion, how Afro-German queer women were um, instrumental to uh, the formation of these organizations. Um, and yeah, just if you could provide some more background, that would be great, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, Ms. Abena really, um, mentioned that I think what's interesting is that the Black German movement was or, or had a variety of origins in terms of thinking about um, Black Germans meeting informally at you know homes, watching films. There are a series of sort of documentaries on films about Black Germans um, in the 80s that um, many Black Germans uh, came together to watch. Um, there was also this sort of um, a Black German meeting, a national Black German meeting in 1985 in Wiesbaden organized by like, I think Helga Emda and um, Eleanor um, Friedendorf Polavi um, and, uh, and a variety of others. So I think there are a variety of moments where you see um, um, black Germans coming together um, and deciding that they were no longer wanted to, to be invisible and seek recognition. Um, and and Adefra and thinking about Adefra as a, as a sort of feminist, strong feminist organization, yeah, queer women that were at the core. Um, I'm thinking of like not only sort of Katarina Ventoya, but Yasmin Edding. I think Yasmin is also here today. Um, Judy Gumich, um, Eva Van Piash. Um, there's so many women who were um, who were queer women who were um, unabashed about their politics and their sexuality and the importance of um, combining those to sort of seek for um, seek um, seek. Um, recognition, but also push for anti-racism uh, on a larger scale in the German context. And so I think, um, I mean, certainly I, the book is, my book is titled, um, you know, Mobilizing Black Germany in the um, um, Afro-German Women in the Making of the Movement. And I, this is not to suggest that Black German men weren't significant figures like Ni Adi and John Contada, and the list can go on. Um, Dani Hafka, um, which Ms. Abina, um, or who Ms. Abina, I think, mentioned. Um, I think there are just there's something about feminist networks and I think about um, queer feminist networks and that sort of meeting at kitchen tables, meeting in cafes, meeting at homes that really helped to facilitate this sort of solid black solidarity in ways that were, were extremely important at the moment. 
And they're also connecting with other um, expats. They're connecting with African-American expats in, um, in Berlin and in other cities. Um, they're connecting with other individuals from across the diaspora, quite frankly, in, you know, when we think about Berlin as a site, um, it becomes a site for um, Black activism in really, really profound ways. But it's like a confluence of events in which, you know, Audre Lorde is teaching at the Free University, but there, you know, Black Germans are also engaging with expats from South Africa, from Ghana, Nigeria, et cetera. So I think all of that together helped to really push um, a, a stronger agenda of sort of black solidarity and black anti-racist activism. I would like also to return to the political climate. You were asking about the political climate. Um, um, I can talk about my upbringing. My upbringing was um, um, Black people at, at, at those days in the 60s were very rare in school. I was the only one in my class. I was the only one, no, not the only one, but there were two maybe in the school and the kindergarten and um, wherever I went, I was the, the first or the only one, whatever. This of course has changed. And um, um, it was actually not so bad uh, when it, came to discrimination, it was there, but um, I also always make a difference between am I discriminated or am I hurt because it's a racist act, a violent act. So, um, and also I had my family as a safe space. My family was my safe space and um, nothing much um, violent happened to me actual violence happened to me outside of my, my safe space. Of course, we all know there's discrimination in, in, in some needles here and, you know, but it was manageable. But if, um, for me, if you say climate, political climate, for me, the political climate, um, a change happened uh, with reunification, if I, if I may say so. And that was the moment when um, I felt climate change concerning xenophobia, animosities, racism, actually an actual change. And um, that is when um, um, I, I um, of course, I became scared. And I, of course, otherwise, on the other side, I had to, I had the feeling I have to stand up again, again and with more power. And I think the whole community, We, I think uh, since the reunification, so many more activism happened, more powerful activism in so many ways. And um, um, yeah, I just wanted to, to mention that on the topic of uh, political climate. Yeah, can I also um, add on? If that's okay, I think um, Ms. Abina is a, is a, is absolutely right that like it's sort of re reunification really sparks a, a new wave of xenophobia, but also like anti black racism on a new scale um, that wasn't necessary that wasn't dealt with in the post 45 period. So I think that's what's been so interesting sort of studying this dynamic community. Um, is that like they were pushing the significance of, of race and racism in the German context through the creation of a new vocabulary of sort of black Germans, Afro Germans, through the discussion about the colonial legacy, through the discussions about like the persistence of racism after the post 45 period in which Germans are like, Nazism is gone, we're no longer racist. And, you know, black Germans are saying, look, you guys are racist. Racism is in the everyday. It's in symbols, it's in, it's in our sort of consumer culture. It's everywhere, it's so pervasive. Um, and so I think, that is an important sort of, I think, a legacy of the, of, of the larger Black German movement, sort of pushing these discussions about race. Um, and also, I think, simultaneously trying to forge, um, you know, multi, you know, multiracial coalitions with other individuals who are also um, dealing with discrimination, um, sort of variety of forms of discrimination in the German context. Um, so I think, it's the, the political climate, like Ms. Abena um, mentioned, is certainly, um, you know, it wasn't sort of fraught as fraught. Um, it becomes much more um, contentious. I think 
going um, um, on both sides of the of the wall. So even in uh, you know former West German um, spaces, you could see the the upsurge because oftentimes the narrative is like, oh, East Germany is the racist space, and I was like, well, it's on both both areas were equally racist. Um, there's no one gets a medal for being less racist. Um, so I think that's what's interesting too is that like this larger context um, in which you know East Germans are fully accepted. You know, you know, you know, we're one, we're, we're, we're ein Volk, but the reality is that no, not everyone was ein Volk and, and that was constantly challenged in the everyday. Um, so that was all I wanted to add. No, I also wanted to ask you, Dr. Florville, I meant to ask you this earlier. I'm interested also how you became interested in Black Germany, um, because I really think that's important to highlight as well. So if you don't mind discussing that. Uh, sure. Um, I was an exchange student. Um, I was like an 18 year old exchange student who um, got received a scholarship to study in Germany for the year. And I lived with a host family in Hamburg. Um, and I had all of these racialized experiences happen to me, um, in which I was like, I thought the Germans weren't racist. Ah, and but they were so like, it was so it was also so insidious. And so um, in my face, um, that I was so intrigued by um, wanting to learn more about um, Black Germans in the German context. And so I had like, a, there were a few Black Germans I knew in my neighborhood. And so anytime we saw each other on the public transport, we'd be like, hey, Black person, I see you. Um, I like you. But I had no, like, I had no idea about Fab and I had no idea about um, a, a larger Black German movement until I left the U. I left Germany and went to the U.S. And I started Googling stuff. Um, and then I Googled all of this stuff about black Germans and was like, oh my gosh, I've got to, I've got to learn more. Um, and I think I was drawn to it because, I mean, both my parents are from the Caribbean. So both of my parents are immigrants to the U.S. Um, and so I'm really, I'm really sort of drawn to narratives, diverse narratives of the diaspora, the African diaspora. And so I think that was also driving, you know, driving me to sort of study more about um, black, um, black Germans and their mobilization. And so that's that's the sort of short story. I mean, I had a German pin pal, which initially started my interest in Germany, um, um, but sort of living in Germany and having all these racialized experiences and the rhetoric of like, Germany is progressive, it's not racist. And I was like, my, my everyday experiences, even in gymnasium are telling me the exact opposite. Um, even with teachers, how they would treat me. Um, the N word was uttered at my um, my my gymnasium. A little a little kid like ran up to me and called me the N word and then ran off. Um, and so I think all of this stuff just made me feel like this needs to be studied. And how come we don't know that Germans are still racist? Like basically, I left my exchange year going, how do we not know Germans are still racist? Um, and that people were resisting that racism. Um, and I think that's the nice, that's a, that's a thing to remember that like, yes, Germans are racist, but like people have always, you know, black people have always been resisting that racism, especially in the German context. Thank you so much. And I can see why that your personal experience uh, catalyze you to pursue your research interests. And also someone said, Jasmine said, Tiffany speaks perfect German, by the way. So- uh, <laughs> Not anymore, Yasmin, not anymore. I need to come back. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for sharing that um, because I think it's important to um, have a discussion on, on what led you to your research. Um, and also this question is going back to Ms. Uh, Abena. I'm interested really in why you decided to contribute to Fabe Beckenen or, or showing our colors. And I'm also interested in like the process of co-authoring the book or are there any memories that stand out to you um, when you were co-authoring this pioneering text? Yeah, those days when uh, my Aim and Katharina Ogentuye and Dagmar Schultz decided to um, write the book Father the Canon, Showing Our Colors. I was actually living in London. And um, of course I had a different uh, experience as a black person, a black woman uh, in London. Um, it was different. It was different in those ways that um, I was not really recognized, um, which was nice and I was not, um, the focus of attention or uh, this, 
the spot in the eye or um, I had a ordinary, yeah, somehow peaceful everyday life. Um, of course, we, we do know uh, also that uh, there's differences and difficulties on racism in Britain, um, but it was, uh, I was more at ease and it was more peaceful. And uh, it happened then that um, I came on a visit and uh, Mai and Katharina already had found um, my gra grandmother and my, and her sister for an interview. And um, I was very happy to join because, um, I think because of the experiences, the different experiences I made while living in London. Um, yeah, that is uh, the first answer. And um, the importance, well, I thought it was important yeah, to, um, to have different stories. And so I just added mine too, <laughs> yeah. Are there any like fun memories or fond memories that you can think of about being with? Yeah, I'm just. Now, yeah, of, um, as I said earlier, Audrey Lord was an ignition for the building the community, and my and Katharina was so well. Well, they were so different, um, but still um, on the same track, and. Um, I was quite impressed by um, how they approached and their will to to do something for the community. So that is, um, and I'm very grateful because um, without Farbebeken and without um, building the initiative for Blacks in Germany and uh, knowing women from Adifra, I wouldn't be the same person. Uh, as I am today. So I'm very grateful. And I think I was, it was, yeah, it was an inner feeling that I had to join in. Definitely. I wish, I wish I was there. I mean, I know that we have, I, I don't know, every time I see um, Audrey Lord in Berlin um, by Dagmar Schultz or reading Showing Our Colors and actually like the new book about uh, Audrey Lord in Europe or Dreams of Dream of Europe uh, by Myra Casha Rodriguez. Um, it just makes me wish uh, I was there at the time. And so thank you so much for sharing um, your memories. Um, definitely, uh, it, it provides a fuller context. And also uh, Dr. Forvo, I'm really interested with your book. Um, you have such amazing um, revelations in your book in terms of what we need to know, particularly as black feminists about this radical black transnational feminist movement building in Europe and Germany. But what were some uh, tidbits in the archive that you thought were very, that stood out to you or you thought that were very interesting while you were conducting your research? It's a good question, Jamie. Um, so most of my stuff, were, most of my materials weren't in the archives. Um, I think during so I was doing dissertation research um, 2011 2012 um, and I kept writing German archives um, in Berlin um, so Bundesarchiv among a variety of others to say do you have anything related to black Germans um, and the response was oftentimes quite negative like no we won't, why would we have something like that um, and I was like okay um, and then one, you know, one instance, they were like, we don't have anything less than 20 years old. And I was like, but the fall of the wall, but okay, I'll just be quiet. Um, and so I'm co corresponding in German. I'm like, you know, please. And they're like, no. Um, and so I basically email, you know, I emailed Dagmar Schultz um, and I said, hi, I know you're one of the editors of Fabi Kennan. Um, is it possible to meet you? And she says, okay. I'll meet you. And who comes to the meeting? Um, like Iku Hugo Marshall and Ria Chidam. Um, and I like, you know, try not to fangirl. And I'm like, oh my God, I have to work. I have to use D, I have to use DAS. Uh, am I using my great, you know? So I'm talking to them and both of them quiz me, you know, Ria and um, Ika quiz me. And, you know, um, by the end, I think I convinced them that I'd read my stuff and knew it. 
and um, they were they were you know open to sharing some um, some stuff. Um, I also ended up getting like shima a mole, sorry, in my um, apartment um, in Berlin, and I ended up um, living with Ria Cheatham for um, a little bit, in which she was like, "Here's." She basically opens up like a, a briefcase of material, and it's like she's like, "Would you think this would be of interest to you?" And I like you know my eyes bug out, and I'm like, "Oh my goodness, yes." Um, and so it was like meeting minutes, it was sort of newsletters, it was just everything that I had been thinking that would, you know, that national archives in Germany would have, because this is important stuff. Um, but, but knowing the institutional racism in Germany, clearly not. Um, and the sort of issue of safety and what's, in, you know, do you really want to give this to, um, to, um, to, you know, German archives. So I um, then ended up emailing um, uh, Katarina. I ended up emailing um, uh, Ricky Reiser. Um, I ended up um, me um, meeting with them. Um, Katarina invited me to her home. I also met up um, at Joliba. She shared some materials and so shared some stories. Uh, Ricky shared some materials and some stories. And then um, I think a real called um, at one point and um, Regina Stein had was moving and needed to get like boxes of my materials out of her basement. And so Rhea and I uh, basically drive to Regina Stein's place, moved the boxes of Maya Eames materials over, you know, it looks like sort of over 20 boxes of stuff there. Um, and, and then we moved them to, to Rhea's basement, but now they're at the Free University. And so that was another site of, um, of material. Um, and then I would travel to a feminist archives and lesbian archives in Berlin to see if I could find traces. So um, at the lesbian archive in Berlin, Spittenboden, I could find traces of Adefra. So there were advertisements for Afriketa and, and Af Adefra in some mainstream lesbian magazines. And in the feminist um, archives, I could find issues of um, Afriketa and I could find some of the um, flyers of organi um, organizational events that were, were going on. But primarily my archive, archival material were, were not in archives, were sort of in personal settings. And like, I wouldn't have found this had I not um, forged some connections with amazing black German women who decided that I was okay um, and that they felt compelled um, to share. So like in my acknowledgements, I, I write about them and say, thank you and I'm appreciative. Um, and so I think the project wouldn't have occurred had those how those women um, opened up their homes to me and time. Like I spent lots of time in like Rhea's kitchen talking to her. Um, I spent lots of time in um, Ricky Reiser's home chatting with her and learning about the inner workings of Afro look and you know some of the things that she felt compelled to do. Um, so that was that was a that was a just so significant for me um, that those kinships that I forged um, shaped me in profound ways. I even, there was a Adefra wellness weekend during my dissertation research. And so Rhea and I traveled to like Hamburg to participate in this Adefra wellness weekend. And I like, I just couldn't imagine, I couldn't fathom that I was actually in this space with some of these women who were doing, who had been doing such amazing work. Um, and so I, that was like a long story, so, sorry. But um, I just, I can't, I guess, I guess I can't stress how the dissertation, the book um, wouldn't have happened without those women um, and that I will continue to be eternally grateful for them. There are copies that I have for those women, but like the postal service now in the US to Germany is a hot mess. Um, and so, um, when I, at, when I tried to find out how much it would cost to send the, so I had took the books to try to measure, um, the, the postal service, um, gentleman was like, this will be $40. And I was like, $40 <laughs> for one book. Oh my Lord. <laughs> like the, I, I did actually say, oh my Lord. I was like, oh my goodness. And because of COVID, who knows when I can physically be back, um, to actually, yeah. So I think there's so many um, there's so many emotions I have because those women um, were not only amazing, but like they thought it was okay to like share um, share their stories with me, and I'm I can't I can't stress enough how how grateful I am. Okay, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> no, you are fine, and, and I understand the fangirling because when Miss Abena uh, like. I was talking to Miss Avon. I was like, oh my, oh my Lord. You know, someone said this is such a black woman response to say, oh my Lord. And it is. And I'm like, 
this is Miss Abena, like a pioneer. I mean, like we're speaking, we're able to speak with, with Miss Abena and for her to uh, provide her context and her history and her activism is so important. And so we're grateful. I'm grateful that um, these radical Afro-German women were able to provide you space and also give you access to information where the institutional archive failed to even incorporate the, the lives, the legacy, activism, and leadership of Black women, but Black people in Germany. And it just speaks to how um, kitchen table conversations and the quotidian of just, uh, you know, speaking with one another um, is also a way of of knowledge production and, and archival uh, uh, information and access and maintaining our story. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, and also too with Ms. Abinus, um, and we're, we're about to go into the last segment of the conversation and we're also gonna have a Q and A portion of the conversation. So please feel free to ask questions uh, because I know many of you have questions, but Ms. Abena, I'm really thinking about um, what are you most proud of in regards to your activism, organizing and leadership? You've done so much, you continue to do so much. I'm just really interested in uh, what are you most proud of and also what are your hopes for the future of Afro-German women's activism and organizing? Um, first of all, I'm proud that um, um, I made the effort to um, to speak out and to stand up for my rights, um, becoming an activist and networker, to be courageous enough to um, step out of my corner. And um, as I said before, I wouldn't be here without uh, Adefra and uh, the community. And um, I've come so far that um, I, um, yeah, how, how can I say it? Um, I don't, I don't shy where, sh don't shy away uh, whenever it's, it's necessary um, when it comes to diversity and human rights in, in different ways, not only black uh, human rights activism and, um, I traveled to Ghana to see my father's country and I learned, developed, um, well, developed, I became more conscious and um, it, all this year I, I became stronger and stronger. And, um, I remember when, um, when I first, when I was young and was looking for jobs, of course, I, I didn't really easily find a job as a black a woman, as a black person in Germany. Um, and, and these days, even within, while I was working, I was um, quite shy. And um, yeah, now I'm the employee's representative for a company with 900 um, people. And um, I wouldn't be, have been, um, in, uh, I couldn't have imagined that uh, 20, 30 years ago to speak, stand up and speak out loud. And um, I think, um, um, and, what I also, uh, I, um, I realized that I will never give, give up. I will never give up fighting for my rights and for, for human rights. And um, yeah, that for short. <laughs> well, I, I think also, there's more aspects. Maybe when we come to a discussion, there will come more aspects. Definitely. Well, also, I just appreciate, um, and I know Dr. Florville can, uh, attest to this, you're just humility um, <laughs> when it comes to your work uh, because you've, you've done so much and we wanna give you your flowers. We wanna honor you. Um, I think that's what this event is really about, honoring you and honoring the other Afro-German women who uh, paved the way, not just for 
black feminists or black people in Germany, but also for black feminists transnationally, including myself, I know Dr. Forville, um, because once we learn about your strategies and your interventions, that can be further uh, tools uh, and interventions for us to keep um, movement building going. And so thank you so much for, for that. And so Dr. Florville, um, obviously you have this groundbreaking and award-winning book and I, and I will drop the link in the chat for people to purchase um, the book. The book title is Mobilizing Black Germany, Afro-German Women in the Making of a Transnational Movement. And so I, I, my question for you is in your opinion, why is it important we interrogate Black German women's activism as critical to the Black radical feminist tradition. And, and through your work and your research, what were some practices, strategies, and inter interventions made by Black German activists that we should apply to our Black feminist praxis and frameworks today? Ooh, that's that's a lot, Jamie. That's, those are all good questions. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's okay, it's good, it's good. Um, I think what Black German women were doing and continue to do is push intersectionality in the German landscape. Um, push this idea that race matters, sexuality matters, class matters. We need to interrogate those inter interlocking oppressions. Um, I think what's also uh, interesting about the activism um, of Black German feminists is that a lot of it was also like spontaneity, like, you know, part, a lot of it wasn't sort of, not to suggest that spontaneity can't be sort of harnessed into sort of positive ways, but I think a lot of this was just a, a sheer will on their part to change things, to organize consciousness raising um, events, to organize conferences, to, to, to have hair workshops, to have a variety of workshops that really, really sort of Featured the diet, the dynamic, um, the dynamic culture of, of Black culture, and what the I think the Black German movement more broadly is, is they really centered and made Blackness legible on the on the on um, in the German nation. Um, they were no longer allowing their their narratives, their culture, their history to be erased, and they they were very public in showing why this this history mattered. Um, and I I'm pretty much struck, I mean, clearly I'm, I'm struck and will continue to research, research on Black Germans until I die. Um, hopefully that's not soon. Um, so like, hopefully it's not, this isn't the one thing, but what's striking to me in a, in a German context in which discussions about race were considered taboo in the post 45 period is that this, this movement, these activists, um, Ms. Abina, um, Yasmin, Ria, uh, the, I mean, the list goes on, even sort of thinking about me, um, thinking about um, Mike Reicher, thinking about um, a variety of other, you know, individuals, is that they're really pushing um, discussions about why colonialism matters. So like the, the ideas about German identity, the ideas about sort of German citizenship are coming from a colonial context in which this is how um, anti-Blackness um, took root um, in, the German, in the German context. And so all of their activism is like highlighting, emphasizing the significance of black histories more broadly, but also black German histories um, through like, you know, Black History Month, through all of these conferences, through solidarity with, um, um, with South Africans against um, South African apartheid. So like they're really um, keen on sort of showing why blackness, black history, all of that matters um, and, they, and it continues to matter regardless of what, you know, what the state says or what other institutions um, do. So I think from, it's a lesson to learn that like, it's been a, there's been a black community in the German context for, for centuries and that they've mobilized in the, you know, in the 20th century in particular um, in phenomenal ways, you know, thinking about the Weimar Republic, thinking about the interwar period in which um, anti-colonial activism was prominent and thinking about like, um, anti-racist activism in the 80s and 90s and how that also was very much like Ms. Abina, Ms. Abina said is very much about human rights. Like we oftentimes don't think about black Germans as fighting for human rights and they were. And that's what, what um, I found so, one of the many things that I found so compelling about um, um, studying and researching um, um, this, this, this movement. Um, and then one more thing, I'm sorry, Ms. Abina, I'm chatting a lot. Um, 
and every time I would read, quite honestly, every time I would read about like the Black German movement, especially sort of in U.S. scholarship, there was basically like a one or two sentence re um, reference to the movement. So there's a discussion about like ESD and ADEFA, but then it was oftentimes discussed as like, oh, these were only cultural movements. These were only cultural organizations, really dismissing you know, the political significance of these organizations. And so I was trying to like do that in my book. It's like, these were cultural and political organizations that were pushing uh, a political agenda, whether you see it or not, it was there. Yes, um, you were asking, what are we proud of? And I think um, I I'm proud of that, um, well, I'm of course amongst those who um, started off the uh, Black German community, but also that um, people, the com uh, yeah, even the government are, are alarmed, and they um, have to be mindful. They have um, they uh, they don't get past us anymore because we are there. We are here. We are there. We are here, and. Um, I think in, in in different ways we are here, and um, they won't get rid of us. And um, also, um, for my own self, that um, it's it's thirty years now that we um, have uh, this sort of community, and um, it won't it won't get easier. <laughs> it's um, it may it might get worse but um we are still we are still fighting and um and that makes me proud that um even my daughter children the young ones those in adolescence um we are more we are much more than on, on in my times and they are also all aware that we are more and um, they they can connect because um, we we uh, made way for places where they can meet where they can connect. Um, it's not like with us when we didn't know where to go, we didn't even think there's anywhere to go or uh, anybody to find to talk to or to exchange or to be empowered or. And even when it comes to my daughter, she was empowered because of my community, because of myself, and she was able to speak up in school, um, ask teachers why they say the N word, um, why they don't teach more um, about um, colonialism. And um, yeah, that is also what I'm pride, proud of. And that, that will happen more because um, also the young ones and those, all those who I need nowadays, all these students, sometimes I say, oh my God, if I would be young at this time, yeah, I could even do more. And um, yeah, that makes me proud. It really should make you proud um, because I mean, you are the blueprint. So thank you so much, lay, lay the foundation. Um, and I wanna read a comment before we go into our Q and A. But Keelan, Keelan, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, please forgive me. Um, they wrote, we are all better for those meetings slash exchanges, coalition buildings that the Afro-German women of Fabe Beckenen forged with one another, as well as black people throughout the African diaspora. Thank you all for this wonderfully rich discussion. Um, and it's definitely rich to have these different perspectives um, on Black uh, German women's movement building. And, and this is such a special space. Someone else said this is a special space and I definitely feel that. And I hope that this discussion also allows our audience members to even study more about Black German women's movement building. I added the links to Showing Our Colors and to Dr. Florville's uh, book, um, uh, I'm so sorry, book on uh, movement building, Mobilizing Black Germany. And please purchase, please support add this to your uh, list of books to read for your black feminist political education um, so that we can continue to grow together um, and learn more about uh, black women's movement building, not only in the US, because oftentimes the US has been the central focus of black feminists or black women's movement building, but around the world transnationally. So 
Thank you all for such a rich discussion. And now we get to go into our Q&A segment um, because people do have some questions. Um, so someone asked, anonymous attendee asked, and I think this is for Ms. Uh, Abena, how do you feel relate with Ghanaian and German, being Ghanaian and German? Do you feel yourselves part of uh, both of the cultures? Oh, well, that's a fine question. Um, well, I'm, jo I'm German, I'm Afro-German, hmm. and I'm lucky anyways that um, I was able to have uh, contact to Ghana. To tell you the truth, um, Ghana is very important for me. Um, I have to be there at least every second year uh, to, yeah, to empower myself and uh, to see also my roots. Mm, I couldn't be without it. And um, I used to, when I was, um, what's it? I was already 30 when I went to live in Ghana for two years, live and work there. Um, and um, well, I, I, um, I became more self-conscious, more confident, and um, I'm, I think I have both, I feel at home in, in both sides, although I'm more at home in Germany because that is where I grew up. I know my corners. In Ghana, of course, I'm also somehow a stranger, but I uh, feel can make myself so comfortable. And um, yes, I think I, I would say I'm also Afro-German, Ghanaian, and um, I'm proud of it. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and so another question, anonymous attendee asks, and I can also drop the question into the chat so other people can read as well. But someone asked, I'm curious to ask further on what both Ms. Abena and Dr. Florval said on how reunification emboldened or made very visible racism. I have family in East Germany and I find that growing current racism, racism in the East is excused by, well, there wasn't much exposure to different people and black people in the GDR. But I believe there are many connections in the GDR to countries including exchanges such as Angola, Ghana, Sao Tome, to name a few, in addition to even deeper rooted Afro-German families. I'm curious to hear about the differences and experiences of Afro-German women in East Germany versus West Germany, and also how these experiences came together post reunification. Drop that in the chat. Would you like to start, uh, Tiffany? Yeah, I can start. Um, I think there are some some differences in terms of the rhetoric of race in both the East and the West. So um, both constitutions in the post forty five period. So constitutions, Grundgesetz in um, the Basic Law in Germany, in um, the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany. Both were created in 1949, and both are basically talking about like they're trying to enshrine in in the law equality uh, under the law, um, and they're trying to also like you know purge race from like the racism from the lexicon. Um, but in reality, um, certainly racism was still you know racism was still a, a, a problem on both sides. In the in um, East Germany, there's also the sort of push their sort of international international solidarity politics that they pushed in which they tried to forge solidarity with a lot of communist um, leaning um, groups um, with African Americans. And so there's a sense that like they're, they're, the way that they positioned themselves was sort of being an advocate for like anti, anti racism and anti colonialism. And then sort of any discussions about race on the ground would also be, you know, considered, well, you, you're causing the problem. Um, there, there's no, there's no issues here, um, and so in that way, I think both race is silenced um, in both the East and the West in those ways. You also had a lot of like Katarina um, uh, and uh, um, Raja, um, our, our Raya, excuse me, are all sort of women who are, um, are from from the former East. 
Um, and so they know those, the context of how um, race occurred. You have also a variety of um, communist leaning um, groups like um, SWAPO, SWAPO, so Namibian um, anti-colonialist movement. You also have um, guest workers in the Eastern, um, in East Germany. So coming from communist leaning countries um, and just like you had guest workers um, coming to, to West Germany. So you have, even though ideologically one was communist, one was um, capitalist, there's still some continuity in terms of how race functioned or how race um, was silenced and ignored in ways. Um, and so I think East Germany was very much uh, um, keen to, to promote itself as, uh, as, uh, as a site for anti-racism and to be this beacon to, to help others who needed help, especially when you think about um, the Free Angela Davis campaign in the, in the East. Um, there's like a new generation of scholars like Jamel Watkins who are working on um, that campaign. And so you have, I think, similarities in how race function in these societies, even though they're sort of ideologically different and the tactics to uh, position themselves in the post-45 period were different. Um, so I think that's part of it. And then I, I don't wanna hog up all the time. So I'll, I'll pass the baton over to Ms. Abana. Um. Yeah, um, experience. Um, I was uh, out dancing the night before the wall came down. I was then a travel agent. And uh, the next morning, of course, all my colleagues and myself went out to celebrate uh, on the streets as most of the people did. And um, that was the, uh, that was actually the first moment when I realized that I am not, we are the people. They uh, made quite clear that um, they don't want me to belong to the, to them. And so I was quite, uh, uh, yeah shocked and disappointed, of course. And because as a travel agent, I was uh, very happy to see that they can travel now, that they're free, freedom of speech, whatever. And um, at the same time, they gave me the feeling that um, you shouldn't talk and you shouldn't be around and you, you shouldn't travel, why are you here? So of course it was in the beginning that um, also because of the news, as we all know, and they said people from the East are racist. And, uh, but to tell you the truth, of course, um, um, it's not only them. And um, those in the West were still quiet at that time. And um, the rising of the racism, um, um, also made them um, speak out. So um, the climate, political climate, we, we did talk about it earlier on, changed since reunification, but I wouldn't say it's only the East, it's uh, countrywide. Wow, thank you so much for both your, your responses, um, I hope that um, whoever asked the question was able to uh, really gain further context because definitely provide personal and historical context as so, it's so important. Um, actually, there's like two similar questions, one from anonymous attendee and another one from Maret. I Forgive me if I'm saying your name incorrectly, um, but they both asked something similar. Uh, where do you see the role and task for the young slash next generation of black feminist activists here? And what message would you give to younger black emerging intersectional feminists? And I think Ms. Abena, I think this question may be for you. So where do you see the role and task for the young slash, slash next generation of black feminist activists here in Germany? And any uh, message you would like to give to them? Well, um... I don't know whether I'm a specialist, but what I am um, looking forward to is that um, um, you use your um, knowledge, um, your education, and um, 
find jobs wherever you can <laughs> in every part of the uh, well of the range of jobs and i um, i believe that um uh, these days it's possible to find a job uh, not as it used to be when i was young and um just uh, mix just mix and allow yourself to go to a place where you don't expect to be um, important. I think you're all important in, in every um, um, business, in uh, kindergarten, school, be lawyers, be whatever. And um, yeah, and try to, um, to do the right thing there. And don't be scared because um, I think um, um, these days um, it's not. It I hope anyway. I hope that's my hope that it's not. Uh, it shouldn't be too difficult to just be a colleague and also be an activist and um, uh, at the same time and also portray that into your workplace. And if you see something wrong in your workplace, find allies. That is what um, I did at my workplace. I work for an NGO. I found allies and uh, we, we, um, we built an informal group on racism within our workplace. And we became more and more and um, um, we were able also to implement the um, the treatment, the treatment act, um, and um, well, it had gone. It has gone further, and um, I think that's the most important. Always find allies where you are, and then act. So much for that. Um, I'm going to read off. Um, I'm going to ask probably like one or one more question because I know that I don't want to belabor anyone's time, and it's. Saturday and I understand people have places to go and things to do but just really quickly um Sharon the Dua Auto said no question just sending mad love to uh Miss Abena and Tiffany um <laughs> XXX with kisses and so um Ali Toure um asked how does one get in contact with our panelists I work with the grassroots campaign in Atlanta Georgia and would love to collaborate um, so if anyone feels comfortable, it doesn't have to be on necessarily on the call now, or if you wanted to put your information in chat, Ali uh, Torre about your contacts, uh, please feel free um, to do that. Um, and also someone asked, Samantha asked, Ghana and many African countries are having crises concerning the human rights of LGBTQ people. How would everyone, oh, Jamie too, imagine using the lessons learned from previous movements to lend Western power and visibility to the needs of people who need activism now, but are too vulnerable to make as much noise uh, needed for change? Samantha, that's a good question. Um, I think what's, uh, I mean, there's so many lessons to learn from Black German activists from the eighties to now. Um, is that they, and it's something that I think I keep coming back to too, because um, Audre Lorde has been a, was a big proponent of it. And I think this is central to coalition building. We have to recognize our differences. We're not all the same, um, and, but we can't use that as a divisive act so that we don't work together to sort of create a more, um, to create more solutions to, to improve the world. So I think part of that is sort of acknowledging that not everyone's the same that it is okay not to be the same, but we can still come together on core issues about equality, about um, you know anti-racism, about human rights more broadly. Um, and I think what's been important in terms of uh, thinking about all of our ability to be immobile, like we can't move, we can't go and travel to different places. That the this pandemic has really changed how we can uh, how we can um, engage in activism. I think hashtag activism is central to that. You know, this allows people to really sort of 
have a have a voice, have a, a have a site um, to really push for discussions about um, um, homophobia or queer fo- um, uh, or like transphobia, um, and sort of organizing around those sort of digital campaigns that allow the 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 the, the individuals who are not vulnerable to sort of have more of a space to sort of push for those changes. Um, and then, and then I forgot to mention earlier that, like, um, in terms of the East German connection, that um, Peggy Pisha, um, excuse me, is a, a Black German activist, feminist, and she published recently a book about um, 1989 and different perspectives about Black German um, Black German um, uh, people during this time. So it's a, a diverse collection of like talking about what were some of the issues, what were the pressing issues, those experiences of people on the ground. So if um, it's hard to get it in the US, um, it's not available uh, on book depository, but um, someone sent me a copy. I mean, it took like five months to get here, um, but like the copy arrived and I like immediately emailed and was like, thank you, it arrived. Um, so it's it's worth checking out. Um, and Peggy is also, was pub- has been publishing about um, she was also born in the East, um, and she's also for years, over 20 years now, quite honestly, been talking about um, Black German um, experiences in, in the East. So that's another um, site of um, sort of ed- uh, to sort of educate, um, educate yourself if you're interested. Um, yeah. Definitely. Thank you so much for that. Um, yes, that question and also that response. I think it's important to... Um, that if you want to learn, um, I don't know, there's so many outlets now for uh, political education and popular education. And listen, um, Black More Radicals has a reading list. Um, if you're interested, uh, there's other conversations at our house on Black More Radicals YouTube about the Black feminist radical tradition. So um, I think it's important that uh, people like myself who are, a, I'm an African American, Black American. Um, also use um, our privileges where we we may have them to expose and share and and use our platforms to engage with Black feminists from a global framework. Um, I think oftentimes when we hear about Black feminisms, we think about U.S. Black feminists, um, particularly Black cis heteronormative feminists, and we don't go outside our, our our nation to, to look at and interrogate who are the Sueli Carneros or the May Aims or the uh, DJ Mil Heberos and, and Marily Francos and all sorts of Black feminists who paved the way. Um, and so I think that that is our responsibility to, to know more. So thank you so much for your question, your responses. And so as we wrap up, because I see that there are more people <laughs> who want to um, um, have more questions. Also, uh, Jasmine Eating said, um, there's also another good book uh, if you're interested in learning more about uh, the Black German uh, perspective. It's called Children of the Liberation by Marion Kraft. Um, yes. So if you're also interested in, in that as well. But I, I really just want to close the conversation because I know I don't want to belabor our guests, but I also want to give Dr. Florvo and Ms. Abena the floor for any last uh, statements that you would like to say before we close out um, to, to just offer that space for you all. And just thank you again, because this, con- this conversation was so generative um, to have this intergenerational and transnational conversation on Afro-German women's movement building. Um, it's so central to not only going back and going back and get it uh, as the, with the con word of Sankofa and to retrieve and reclaim um, the, our historical black feminist traditions, but also to apply to the contemporary so we can move forward in, in liberation and where we wanna see our world go. So if you would like to offer any last statements, um, feel free at this time. Yeah, can I just say thank you um, to all the sort of black German women who were and continue to be a force to be reckoned with. Um, and that's clear in the Black Lives Matter movement too in Germany, that like, you know, black German women are still, um, and other sort of women of African descent are still sort of pushing significance of why Black Lives Matter. So I just want to thank um, Sabina as well as Yasmin, as well as Sharon, 
who's also done so much for um, the, the community as well as uh, and Rhea, um, all of the, you know, they're here. Marion Craft was, uh, has also been a, a key person. So I just wanna say thank you for doing the work um, so that many of these women, these new sort of feminist activists can continue the work that you, you guys began and have been able to sustain in ways. Um, it may seem cheesy, but um, I think part of my, I think I should sort of also add part of my nervousness with this event was also just talking to, um, you know, Abina, Miss Abina, and sort of, you know, one of this, you know, pioneers um, in so many ways. Um, and so I just thank them for the work that they do and continue to do. Um, and I'm grateful and I know, um, you know, generations are grateful. And I'm just a, an Afro-Caribbean woman from the US who's grateful, so. Well, um, I'm, quite, I'm quite surprised that time is up already. I was expecting and hoping for more questions and more exchange and I'm ready because I was also very nervous in the beginning and uh, now I feel at so much at ease that I could talk for hours. Um, so, um, Yes, I thank you everybody for being here. And it was also my first time in English to uh, chat, uh, to chat uh, yeah, with a few people. And um, um, thank you everybody for joining in. And um, yeah, I, I hope there's more to continue. And Tiffany, although we didn't make it 10 years ago, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully soon. Um, I'm also, well, today the truth, I didn't, uh, read the book yet, your book yet, but of course I will. <laughs> and I will try to get it here, not $14 uh, for postal charges. And um, yeah, thank you everybody. And um, yeah, well, I could talk. I would like to talk more. <laughs> yeah, I would totally like to talk more. Maybe we'll have to do a, a follow-up event um, if, <laughs> yes. if you're interested, um, if you both are interested. Because um, I feel like I can talk to talk for hours with you, Ms. Go deeper, yeah, so, go deeper yeah, into it. I have some questions, so, um, but I can, I can probably email you those questions. Um, but yeah, maybe a, a summertime follow-up of uh, if Jamie wouldn't mind. <laughs> oh my goodness. I mean, I wish we, I wish we didn't have to wrap up. I'm always so cognizant of everyone's time. And now I'm like, I can't believe like the hour and a half like went up already. Um, but I, I would love to do a follow-up. People in the comments are saying, yes, we will be there um, 100%. And I just really cannot emphasize enough. Thank you for all that you both do. Thank you for your time, your leadership. I'm so grateful and I, I, I'm not going to cry. Every, with every Black Men Radicals event, I learned so much. And I'm so just appreciative of, of community building with, with people from all over the world, black feminists from all over the world. It's certainly my joy. And yes, it makes me quite happy to see these conversations happening. So yes, thank you so much again, both of you. If you both are interested in having a follow-up part two on this discussion, I'm here, we are here. And thank you to everyone for being here. Um, someone said after Corona, we will meet in person. Yes, after, after the coronavirus, one day we will meet in person. Um, and so someone said, I'm going to leave off with this. Someone put this comment. Thank you so much for this important conversation and work. I wish Afro-German history will eventually become part of the German school curriculum, such an important part of German history. And I hope one day too. I really hope so. So God bless you all. Thank you so much. And looking forward to part two of this conversation. Thank you, Ms. Abena. And thank you, Dr. Florville. Appreciate you all so much. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Ms. Abena. Um, thank you um, for everyone who came and be safe. Yes. Stay healthy. Yes, no, please. No one, yeah, no one get Corona. <laughs> no, definitely not. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night.